Hello everyone and welcome to the final of our three-part DCS introduction series. Today we're going to focus on multiplayer and what we're going to refer to as end game content for DCS. Okay, so you've successfully downloaded and installed DCS. You've decided on an airframe or maybe you haven't. And you've done some tutorials to get the hang of actually flying in a military flight simulator. So now what? Well, to start with, you can play the included free or paid DLC for different modules, and some of those can actually be a lot of fun and quite informative. Though if you don't come from a military aviation background, some of these might actually be a little tricky to pick out in your head how you should do something that isn't spelled out directly to you. Perhaps you've jumped into the mission editor and spooled up a few of your own missions, or you're just messing around in the instant missions. All of that is great, but at the end of last video I said that my first year in DCS I played alone, and that that was a mistake. It was. I couldn't tell you the difference between a base leg or a down leg approach. I couldn't tell you what a one circle was, or that I shouldn't let my speed get too low on the Viper going after a Tomcat. My immersion into the game was capped to my own imagination, and sometimes my AI wingman might talk to me, but I was alone in my own little DCS world. This is where multiplayer comes in, and from a gaming perspective where DCS not only shines, but practically exists. Retired pilots looking for a romp in the old seat is what single player is for, but if you are in DCS for gameplay, you need to be in multiplayer. On the one side, DCS multiplayer is fairly straightforward. Click the multiplayer button on the menu, and up comes the server list. Join a server, have fun, except most of these are closed to the public. They have all these requirements, and yeah, this isn't Call of Duty. You're going to have to matchmake on your own, and that means leaving DCS for a minute. Multiplayer in DCS comes in a few different varieties, but they all generally start in the same place. One of the best ways to get started with multiplayer is head over to the Eagle Dynamics forums and navigate to the threads for different multiplayer groups. From there, simply follow instructions to reach them and join in on the action. For our purposes today, we're going to break these groups into three categories. Open multiplayer communities, multiplayer groups, and virtual squadrons. The lines are not as clear potentially as I'm going to lay them out here today, but this should give you a general idea of the level of play at each of those positions. The first group mentioned is open multiplayer communities, or servers for that matter. One of the best and most prominent groups in this category is Hoggett. These guys have a website that breaks down a lot of the stuff you're going to need to learn. It is a source for OVGME and other such stuff, and they operate centrally from a Discord server. There is no membership to Hoggett. You simply join their Discord and join their servers and go fly. They operate a few servers and some have running missions going that you can go up and fly. There's little to no structure, so you might see others in the sky with you, or you might not. Some guys might head up to do some one-on-one -on -one dogfighting, others may not, other guys might be doing some air-to-ground stuff. That's how these groups run. They are, for our purposes, the basic foundation of multiplayer play, because you have the advantage of having other players to meet, play with or against, and have some fun in DCS. Guys like Hellrain regularly play on servers like this one on YouTube, so if you're looking for more details on these sorts of groups, head over and check that out. Some folks in the Hoggett community play exclusive to those servers, while others float across the multitude of these groups as multiplayer nomads. The next group and tier in our discussion are multiplayer groups. Understand the lines from here are less clear, but generally groups like this operate servers that also run 24-7 just for general multiplayer play, but they also have group missions and campaigns. The most prominent example here would be the Grim Reapers, which, if you follow DCS on YouTube, you've probably heard of. These sorts of groups require a degree of membership, which typically involves some demonstration of basic flying ability. You'll need to pass a check ride, and then you're in the group. From here, these groups usually have set days and times they run missions, though as a point of clarification here, there's generally no restrictions placed on the community at large. Fly what you can, do what you can, and so on. The mission is to bomb a luxury yacht with a drug lord on board in the harbor. There's some SAMs, some enemy MiGs overhead. Maybe the mission has five people who show up. Maybe the mission has 25 people who show up. Dan's gonna fly as A4. What are you gonna fly today? Let's go out and have some fun. 
That's normally the way I would describe these sorts of a group. These groups are great if you're trying to get in on one of the things DCS offers over the arcade style games. Working as part of a team to pull something off and starting to use some of those advanced systems to deliver. These groups offer something else as well. A relatively dedicated player base that is usually happy to help you learn to fly different modules and have a lot of fun while improving your craft. This takes us to the meat and potatoes of today's video. The last tier. The full embodiment of what DCS brings to the multiplayer game table. These are virtual squadrons. The principal example for today will be Joint Task Force 1, which is a step up from a virtual squadron and that it's actually eight virtual squadrons in one. JTF1 runs four servers, including an ever-present fun map complete with bombing ranges that report accuracy and other fun training stuff, as well as servers that run scripted resetting campaigns for fun. Similar to the multiplayer groups before, they also have a dynamic campaign that takes place on set days and involves the different squadrons working together. So what's the difference then? To start with, realism. The dynamic campaign of JTF1, currently Operation Liberty, is an ever-changing scenario based on previous performance. Which isn't to say that the Grim Reapers don't either. But the difference is in mission execution. In the week preceding the mission execution, different units fly reconnaissance and locate targets in their assigned missions, and return intelligence data that will be used in the briefs. From there, timetables are worked out, mission orders and materials are generated, and the mission is executed with the assorted squadrons executing their generally assigned missions. VMFA-122 may precede the main effort and run a fighter suite, while VMFA-251 follows behind on a deed strike, which paves the way for the 55th Fighter Squadron to perform a runway strike while VF-2 pushes past and runs another deep strike mission. Virtual squadrons typically operate with a more rigid operational execution that mimics the real tactics of the real-world counterparts. The missions have real-world constraints applied as well. From the get-go of Operation Liberty, the 55th has been stationed at Aldafra in the southern end of the map. Just because the mission is moving into central Iran doesn't mean the Vipers there are going to launch 10 minutes away from the action at Jask. It will be a 45-minute formation flight to the operational area. It will be a 45-minute formation flight back from the operational area to Aldafra. If you have to tank, the squadron will tank, both ways if need be. This potentially sounds over the top or even not enjoyable. I'll take the time now to point out that these are not progressive levels of a game you beat. Each player must find the right level for them. The core difference here, the benefit, is everything this opens the table for. JTF1 routinely operates with human air controllers in the AWACS and ATC roles. It's a different level of immersion to be directed to enemy fighters by a real person. When you play the single-player red flag campaign in a ground attack mission, you watch the AI cap flight clear the way ahead of you for a scripted and carefully balanced mission. On Mission Night in JTF1, real players are performing that role, and anything can happen. They might be shot down by a SAM no one was aware of. Some IRAF MiGs might slip under them, and now you have to go defensive and handle it yourself. More importantly, this sort of gameplay utilizes every ounce of features available in DCS, you're going to have to use every part of the aircraft at some point in some way to succeed. Which brings us to the other massive difference. Every pilot in JTF-1 belongs to a squadron. Every squadron is capped in size to the real number of pilots and jets, normally 12. This is because you're assigned an aircraft. F-16-960084 is my Viper. It has my name on it. Now for some, this might appear to limit your experience or curtail your enjoyment. What this really does is create a closeness. These guys become close friends. I have their phone numbers, and some groups even gather in real life. You end up with inside jokes. You begin to know who's flying just by the way they're flying. You train together, fly together in missions, and in the back of your head, the differentiation between game and real life begins to blur just a little more than usual. That's immersion. This is the experience I talk about when I say this is the best gaming experience you can have. And it doesn't just involve your squadron mates either. Rather, they just become the nucleus to the larger family of JTF-1. After your first month, it feels like you know half the guys in the other squadrons as well. You join in with them for a fight night, or mess around on a fun map, or do Operation Snowfox together. This is where you find the ex-Top Gun instructors. This is where you find the real-world test pilots. The guys who flew some of these aircraft in real air forces around the world for 30 plus years. 
these are the sorts of guys who hit you up on a Thursday afternoon to see if you want to go put some flight hours in, having fun in the skies of DCS. The years of knowledge is downright impressive. What's more to that is JTF1 is an online club, a social gathering place for like-minded enthusiasts who enjoy the hobby and challenge of military flight simulation, a group with a dedicated goal of providing a realistic military aviation environment. The core difference between JTF1 and some other virtual squadrons, however, is this hangout mentality, which doesn't quite stray too far from the unofficial of the real world. JTF1 is unranked and drama-free. Yes, there are squadron commanders in the brain test to facilitate good order of operations. Yes, squadrons have standard operating procedures, but I don't call my squadron commander sir, and you don't have armchair generals barking orders. This is about building the most immersive and realistic flying experience, not the unrealistic militant dreams of some 16-year-old guild leader. In fact, generally for JTF1, you'll have to be over 21 years old, partly because we drink together, and partly because this does demand a modicum of maturity. Multiplayer groups can teach you to fly a whole bunch of modules, but joining a group like JTF1 will make you an expert in just one. I'm part of the 55th Fighter Squadron. As previously mentioned, I have an F-16 to fly, and on campaign nights, this is the only bird I can fly. The goal of the group is to know the Viper like the real Viper drivers do, knowing her quirks, knowing how to get everything out of her if you can, how to operate every feature as if it was the primary feature. This might seem constraining, but the dedication means that you end up with guys who can fly literal and figurative circles around other DCS pilots who never take the time to master one module. This isn't to say you'll never fly anything else either, because half the fun of JTF1 are when you bump into the squadron room of a different group of guys and invite them to come do something on a server, whatever it may be, cutting over hodgebacks, sightseeing the Normandy map at dusk, whatever you want. In fact, the opposite is really the truth, because when I want to know how to do something on my F-14, when I want to learn how to make it do something, a quick drop into the VF2 channel and I've got a team of coaches walking me through every step of the way to fly it like they do. The goal is mastery of a module, not restriction to it. As I mentioned, JTF1 has limited space unlike some other multiplayer groups, especially depending on what you want to fly. For example, there's only one F-14 squadron, VF2, though it's twice as large because they require human Rios as well. There are two F-16 squadrons, including JTF1's European Time Zone squadron, the 480th. There are three F-A-18 squadrons in both Calamari and Crayon variation, and there is the AV-8B represented in VMA-231. As a result, there's generally an expectation that you participate regularly, because for some units, there are people waiting. However, you can generally get in somewhere, and if demand were large enough, and with enough willing to take on the work, new squadrons have been set up in the past. JTF-1 also participates with other similarly-minded virtual squadrons like the BSD Halo guys, so it's not uncommon for other groups to join in on missions, or hang around, and if need be, you could always be pointed somewhere that could take you if there really was no room. Likewise, there are communities like the Viper Pit, Tomcat Alley, and Hornet's Nest that are all dedicated to an airframe with listings of virtual squadrons, and you'll find members of those groups in JTF-1 and other groups. Despite the restricted size of the squadrons, mission nights average around 65 virtual pilots all flying the mission as different packages of, of the overall product. This is three to four hours of the closest you can get to doing it for real in DCS. To make it here though, you have to have the drive of a real military pilot. Show up thinking that minimum effort is going to pass muster and you're going to see the cold shoulder. Your poor performance could ruin the mission night for a lot of other guys who worked really hard to play at this level. Show up with the right attitude, the willingness to learn and put in the time, and you probably won't fly anywhere else. Except maybe with some other virtual squadrons. A few guys do like to double dip. To recap then, multiplayer comes in a variety of options, and these are not a ladder to climb. There's no restriction to one or all, and all of them connect to various DCS multiplayer events. If you're looking for fast, casual multiplayer fun, seek out groups like Hoggett. These are vibrant communities filled with excellent pilots. Ask, and they'll teach you. If you want co-op mission play, seek out multiplayer groups and virtual squadrons. Again, the lines here are not crystal clear. Some virtual squadrons have more or less restrictions. Some multiplayer groups have more or less restrictions. I simply define them as such here to help demonstrate their differences. 
multiplayer communities in DCS are so numerous, it would be impossible for me to reasonably list and define them here. Head to the ED forums and look at the listings. Visit their discords and websites. Chat them up. Find out if they're the right group for you. If what I described for Joint Task Force 1 is what you're after, we're always looking for new pilots to join the ranks. Lists for all of these are down in the description below. I look forward to seeing you in the skies. As always, don't forget to like and share this video, subscribe if you haven't, and I will catch you all next time.